everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, you're probably aware you're here for the Jim Pattison Children's Hospital Research Grants Information Webinar. Um, so I'll be doing a quick overview of uh, who Jim Pattison is, uh, what they're looking to fund, and then going into some more details about the application process um, and who's eligible, how to apply the review criteria, and all of those helpful tips and information for successfully applying for this funding. Um, before I jump into all the information, I'm just going to take a moment to acknowledge that um, here in Saskatoon, which is Treaty 6 territory, um, and just encourage everyone to take a moment to reflect on their connection with the lands and each other and um, consider how reconciliation affects you. All right, uh, so our agenda today, as I mentioned, we'll be going through um, all the information, all the information about this program, how to apply, why it's being run. Um, so this program is being administered on behalf of the Jim Patterson Children's Hospital Foundation, um, because we already have these processes in place that lets us run a uh, rigorous peer review process and grant management. Um, so we'll be going through all the most important information from the application package found on both Jim Pattison and Scherf's websites. Uh, we do highly recommend also reading the application package all the way through, um, in addition to attending this information session. session. Um, this session will be recorded and available on our website. And um, so, yeah, if anyone misses anything that they need to check again or has colleagues that would also like to see this, um, the link will be posted and shared within the next few days. All right, and so we'll start with the Pass and Children's Research Grant Program uh, about the funder and the priority areas. I'm just going to check one last time that this isn't working out for Lisa. Um, yeah, so uh, Jim Pattison. Uh, so the Jim Pattison Children's Hospital Foundation um, is the uh, main organization that works to provide specialized maternal and children's healthcare throughout the province and pursue the advancement of innovative research. Um, each year, the foundation provides approximately 400,000 to our provincial health research community to discover, evaluate, and implement new approaches to delivery of care, maintaining health, preventing, and curing disease. Uh, their research vision is to support the Children's Hospital as it transforms provincial specialized maternal and children's health care. Um, and ensuring it reaches the four corners of the province and is designed to meet the need of all patients equally. Um, they want to support world-class maternal and children's research that will improve health outcomes for Saskatchewan mothers and children. Um, so a little bit more about the research program specifically. Um, they want to support interdisciplinary research projects with the potential to enhance pediatric and or maternal health care in the following departments within the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Um, so I'm not going to read through this list, but it's there and it's in the application package if you need to reference it. Um, and the specific research priorities that projects must address in order to be able to apply for this call um, include novel therapeutics, uh, remote access and artificial intelligence, mental health, Indigenous health, improvements to provincial quality of care, and or improvements to maternal pediatric care. Um, the, so the application packages I mentioned can be found on their website. Um, we have some screenshots of the website here just to help you navigate as you're finding that. Um, so application packages on their website. Um, it's under the how you can help and then apply for a grant um, area. And then if you scroll down to the bottom, there's the research grant and that gives you all the details there in the timeline. 
Um, you can also find the information on the SHRP opportunities page on our website. All right, uh, so now I'll jump into the applying for the grant. So the application process, process eligibility, all of that fun stuff. Um, so first to get you started, as I mentioned, you'll need the application package. Um, it's broken into three broad sections. We have the program guide, which outlines the application requirements, review process, and the grant management policies you'll have to follow. Um, we also included a glossary of definitions. Um, since this isn't a SHRF program, um, we defined the definitions in terms of this program. So if you have any clarification on what a knowledge user is, for example, that can be found in there. Um, and then the last section is the application instructions, which walks you through how to use the SHRF research management system um, that the application process takes place using. Um, and it just walks through the steps a little more clearly there to make sure you know exactly which questions are supposed to be addressing what and how they are filled out. Um, so, and then uh, continuing the getting started. So the SHRF research management system is our grant management system. So all applications, all applications and information are submitted electronically through this. Um, the principal applicant is the one that has to start the application and is in, responsible for ensuring all the information is included um, in the proper format and is submitted by the deadline. Um, so this includes reminding and supporting project members to accept invitations to the application and complete their contribution form. Um, the system won't let an uh, application be submitted if there's any outstanding invitations that have not been accepted and completed. Um, but then if you have any issues with um, individuals that don't have internet or email access or just uh, technical difficulties in general um, with the RMS, you can always contact SHRF and we have some options. Um, it also allows you to add a grant writer. Um, so if you have someone working with you, helping you fill out the application, you can add them in this role and they will also have access. Um, they will not be able to submit the application for you, however. Um, as I mentioned, if you're using the SHRF RMS and having any technical difficulties at all, we have the SHRF help desk um, email, and then we also have a user manual and some SHRF um, YouTube how-to videos that are found on our website under resources. Um, so important dates. Uh, so the first most important one is the elig eligibility check cutoff. Um, that's coming up on November 10th by 4.30 p.m. Um, completing this step, um, just make sure that projects are eligible before you do all the work completing a full application. Um, and it gives us some time to prepare a review, review committee for the expected applications. Um, relevance will be confirmed by Patterson, Patterson Children's following this deadline. Um, at that stage, there's no signatures required and you may change any of the information provided, but applications will be screened again at the full application deadline in January to make sure eligibility is still met. Um, and this is a very important step because only those who have passed eligibility will be able to submit a full application deadline application. Um, so if you miss the eligibility deadline, you will be unable to submit a full application. Um, after those two, the funding decisions are expected for March 31st, 2023, with a funding start date of May 1st, 2023. Uh, so the funding, there is $370,000 available this year. Um, and We've changed the amount of funding a little bit this year. Um, this time, teams can choose between $25,000 and $100,000. And they can also choose either a one-year or two-year term. Um, so this gives a little more flexibility for different scopes of projects. If you have something smaller that's just one year, you can request one-year term and a smaller amount. Two years, you can go for a bit more. Um, uh, the only note here is that the amount requested within the range should 
um, be commensurate with the scope of the work that is being proposed and justified. Oh, okay, ah, uh, just one second. Uh, so as I was saying, the amount requested should be commensurate with the scope of work and justified based on the proposed research and knowledge mobilization activities. Um, funding is not renewable, um, but no cost extensions may be granted um, if required and justified. Um, so for example, in the past years, COVID was an obvious delay, um, but we do ask that timelines be well thought out that they can be achieved within the proposed timeline. Uh, so our first steps for eligibilities and the requirements for principal applicants. Um, so the first one is principal applicants need to be affiliated with institutions eligible to hold SHRF funds. So these are the institutions with a memorandum of understanding with SHRF. Um, that includes the universities and colleges and the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Um, additionally, there are some requirements on the project teams. Um, so there needs to be a minimum of three applicants. Um, one of those three must meet the requirements of principal applicant, as outlined in the previous slide. And then there has to be one person in each of these three roles that are laid out. Um, and only one person can fulfill one role. Um, so on that minimum of three applicants, one of them needs to be a researcher who holds a position which supports them to pursue, pursue research. Uh, one needs to be a knowledge user who's interested in the applications of the knowledge generated from the research. Um, and I think we specify for this one that it has to be a healthcare practitioner. Um, and then the third role is a person with lived experience. Um, and so this is someone who has personal experience with a health issue or experience as an informal caregiver. Um, and then, so that's the minimum. There are other project roles if your team is larger than this. Um, so there's no maximum number of applicants, but um, you should be considering contributions and feasibility of meaningful contributions to the project. Um, basically, this is in saying that um, we don't want to see people signing their name to something just because they can. Uh, we do want to see that if someone is on the project team, they're being meaning they're meaningfully contributing to the project. Um, so these include, these roles can include co-applicants. Um, so these are the main project team. They contribute to intellectual, cultural, or scientific direction of the project. Um, they come in three types or descriptors as they're called in the research management system. Um, and those are the three that I just described in the last slide, the researchers, knowledge users, and people with lived experience. Um, another role we have is personnel. So that is where if you have anyone already hired working on the project, um, this includes your trainees, research staff. Um, in this role, they are allowed to be compensated from grant funds. Um, and the final role is for supporters. Uh, so these are for individuals or organizations who provide a limited and defined role in the project. Um, so this is where if you have anyone that wants to write a letter of support for the project, they can be added in this role. Um, so our allowable expenses. Um, we have the grants may be used for the following. Uh, we have research expenses. So this includes salaries of staff, including research assistants, technicians. Uh, materials, supplies, services, research travel, knowledge translation, or dissemination of results. Um, one note is that academic conference travel is limited to $3,000. Um, the grant can also be used for equipment or purchase, uh, purchase or rental. So this does include computers. Um, but equipment purchases in general are limited to up to 10% of the total budget request. 
um, and equipment should be justified and shown that it is required for the completion of the project and it cannot be obtained through other means. Um, a couple other notes about the allowable expenses. Um, so we should be seeing direct costs only. Um, the grant does not pay for general overhead operating costs or maintenance. Um, and the research activity has to be in Saskatchewan. Um, so any trainees gonna be supported by the funds um, must be in Saskatchewan. Um, as a general guideline, we ask that applicants follow the rates set by their host institution. Um, and there will be two budget tables in the application to complete. So there's the first budget table for the grant request amounts and the specific expenses. And then there's a second table for other contributions. Um, so if there are other resources that are required to successfully complete the project, um, but that are out of the scope of this grant application, you can list those there and that um, will help show the feasibility of your project and that you have these other sources secured and will be able to do the work accordingly. Uh, so within that budget table, the categories break down um, as so. So there's the personnel, so that's salaries and benefits. Uh, research, research costs are broken into materials and supplies, services. So this might be like contracts or other services you have to pay for. Uh, research travel and then equipment. Um, and then the final category is for knowledge sharing cost. So they break into two types, academic and non-academic. Um, and then the note there, the academic conference travel is limited. Um, but non-academic does not have the same limit. Uh, for the application process, I already talked a little bit about the eligibility check and why we're doing it. Um, so just to get into the specifics of how this is completed, um, the principal applicant completes and submits this section of the application in the SHARP RMS. Um, we have to see that the minimum team membership is being met. So they should be invited to the application and then they will also be listed in the eligibility table in the application. And this will just outline their roles so that we can see that yes, you have a researcher versus a knowledge user and a person with lived experience. Um, you'll be asked to identify the priority area that your project is addressing. Um, and then be asked a brief 150 words uh, fit with the program. So you identify the priority area and then you give us a brief description of how it's addressing that priority area and why it fits with the overall purpose of the Patterson Children's Research Grants. Um, then we also ask for a proposed research overview um, which is more or less an abstract of 300 words um, plus five keywords. Um, and those two sections there, that is for SHRF um, to identify the area and expertise we will need on our review committee to be able to assess your application. Um, and then we also do ask for some suggested reviewers. Uh, we do not recruit reviewers from outside of Canada. So we ask that any suggested reviewers are in Canada, but outside of Saskatchewan. Um, and no signatures or institutional approvals are required at this stage. Um, once submitted, the eligibility checks are screened by the SHRF program manager, um, which will be me for this competition. Um, and I am checking again for your minimum team requirements and passing on the review information to our peer review manager. Uh, relevance of the priority area will be confirmed by Pattison Children's uh, Grants Committee. Um, when we pass information to Pattison Children's, the information is anonymized um, so that they don't have any names at this point. Um, there is a chance for revisions after the eligibility decisions are made. Um, say if you've submitted and you are missing one of your team requirements, 
or something wasn't quite clear, we will ask for follow-up information. So there is a chance there um, to get another shot at it. Um, and as I mentioned, the purpose is to um, just really make sure that we are prepared uh, for the peer review and have created a, a relevant uh, committee and to um, ensure that teams are eligible and relevant to the funding opportunity purpose. Uh, once the eligibility is finished, um, your application and the eligibility is improve, approved, um, the new tabs will appear in the RMS under your application where you can start filling in the rest of your information. Um, so once you've reached the full application stage, there will be a tab that appears that is called proposed project. Um, and some of the questions this will ask for, so. This is where you enter both your scientific and plain language titles and summaries, um, your sex and gender considerations, ethics, target audiences, uh, where your proposal will be uploaded as well as any supplementary materials, uh, your one page timeline. Um, and remember the timeline can be for one or two years, um, whichever one you've chosen. Um, there's also a section on, under this tab about previous research progress and reapplication. Um, so if you've already completed some work that supports this proposal, there is an opportunity to outline that there. Um, anything that might help the review committee see the feasibility and promise of the application. Um, or if this is an application that you've previously submitted to the competition, um, to try to get funded again, uh, I should say unsuccessfully previously submitted and are submitting again. Um, you can also indicate this and we will uh, provide an area to address the reviewer feedback provided on the previous application. Um, if you are reapplying, we do recommend that you address the reviewer feedback and allow us to share the review comments with the committee. Um, it's some, the, yeah. Uh, the committee, there are usually some of the same reviewers from year to year, um, and they just in general, they do really appreciate seeing that you've taken reviewer feedback and thought about it and tried to address it as suits the project. Um, on this page, there's also, I think, five text boxes for the CAS impact categories. Um, so that gives you 100 words to describe the impact of the proposed research in a variety of categories, including health benefits, economic impacts, et cetera. Um, the next tab is the budget tab. Um, so in addition to the Excel budgets that I outlined already, um, there's also a two-page budget justification that can be uploaded. Um, so this is where you have some space to explain your expenses and why they are the amount that they are. Um, and so this should reflect um, each budget um, item entered into the Excel. Um, for the budget itself, um, there is an Excel template in the RMS, which can be downloaded, completed, and then re-upload to auto-populate the RMS table. Um, so in this Excel, the categories and labels can't be altered or the auto-populate will not work properly. Um, and again, um, there'll be columns for one and two years. Um, you just fill in as applicable to the term you've chosen. Um, if you've chosen one year, the year two column can be left blank and that is perfectly fine. Um, and just remember the maximum amount is 100,000. Um, there are three sheets total in that Excel file, though. So that was the first one, the budget table. Um, there's also the other contributions table that I mentioned, where you list any other resources you have supporting this project. Um, and then the third tab on that Excel file is where you outline the overlap. Um, so this is for other funding you've applied for or obtained that has perceived or actual overlap with this application. 
Um, and then there is a field to upload any other budget documentation you might have. So quotes, contracts, et cetera, to um, support your budget expenses. Um, the next tab on the application is the roles tab. Um, so this is the part that is completed by the invited co-applicants, personnel, and supporters through the contribution forms. Um, and so each of these roles has different requirements of the individuals of what they will be asked to provide. Uh, so co-applicants, they will have to select their project role descriptor. Um, so that is the researcher, knowledge user, or person with lived experience. And then the next step will depend on the role. Um, all of them will be asked the hours per week on the proposed project they intend to contribute. Um, so this can be any amount as just whatever's relevant and needed for the project. Um, they will be asked to describe their role in the proposed project in 100 words or less. Um, so this is where they can say, I have the expertise to um, inform this method or I have this perspective I'm contributing, um, any of the things like that. Um, and then finally, they'll be asked to upload a document depending on their role. Uh, so co-applicants, there will be a CV or testimonial, um, and I'm gonna break these down in the next slide. And then supporters are providing a letter of support. Um, personnel don't have to provide a CV or anything like that. Um, so for the co-applicants, ones that selected a project descriptor of researcher have to provide a CCV. Um, so in the CCV portal, there is a Scherf Patterson Children's Research Grant template um, to choose as the template for your CCV. Um, and then just a note that it does need to be a final version, not a draft version of the CCV. Um, if you have any questions about this, you can contact us or the, also there is the CCV support system there. Um, I think the email and phone number for that are also provided in the application package. Uh, for co-applicants that are knowledge users, uh, they will be asked to provide um, a knowledge user CV. So Scherf has a template for this with some headings. Um, but they can also use a CCV um, if they have a lot of research experience and have that at their disposal. Um, they can also use their own format of CV, um, but the headings should match up with what's in the SHRF template. Um, and then co-applicants who are a person with lived experience are asked to write a, or record or provide in whatever format works for them. Uh, testimonial. Um, so it should be about 250 words, or if you're providing an audio version, about two minutes. Oh, I see. Uh, I see some questions popping up in the chat. I think I'll circle back and answer them at the end, if that's all right. Um, and then uh, for the testimonial, so the prompt that they are asked to address in their 250 words is to the degree you're comfortable sharing, please tell us about your experiences, which have led you to be interested in participating on the research team for this project. Um, and again, so uh, we know the Sheriff RMS isn't the most user-friendly system, especially for people who maybe have less internet access or aren't used to working on research grants. Um, so if you have any, um, issues, um, getting them online to accept the invitation and upload these uh, materials, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and contact us and we can um, figure out something that works for everyone. Um, and then finally, the last tab is the approval page of the application. Um, so this is where the, is the approval form signed by the principal applicant and their host institution um, for the research office representative. Some institutions will have internal deadlines to get this approval prior to the application deadline. 
Um, so something to be mindful of depending on where you work. Uh, we don't require co-applicant signatures on these forms anymore. Um, the acceptance of the RMS invitation by email now replaces the co-applicant signatures, um, which is why it's important that people are logging on and accepting the RMS invitation. Uh, so uh, the next step is the peer review process. So I'll talk about the criteria and scoring a bit here. Um, again, all of these are listed in the application package, and it's a very good idea to read those through since this is what the review committee is considering as they read your application. Um, so I've just, there's four categories that I've given just a very high overview of what they look for. Uh, so 30% is weighted for the idea. So that's your project purpose, goals, objectives, and also the degree which the research is original, unique, and creative. Um, the approach and feasibility is weighted for 30%. So that's kind of the specifics of your project, the budget, the timeline, the scope of the work, whether you have addressed the potential pitfalls and um, if you have any mitigation strategies for those to make sure that your project is successful. Uh, development and impact we have for 20% of the criteria. Um, and so this is the importance and expected contributions of the research for pediatric and or maternal health. Um, also your knowledge sharing outcomes are considered here. Um, and finally, there's the expertise, experience and resources for 20%. So the, um, we're asking the reviewers to look that there's complementary and is interdisciplinary knowledge, experience, and expertise um, that will benefit the research question. Um, they also consider the research environment under this category. Um, so they wanna see that you have the support and resources you need in order to complete this. Um, and so all of these criteria together um, will get your peer review score. Uh, we use the SHRF five point scale. And so we have that breaks down into these categories of outstanding, excellent, etc., based on the score. Um, and the Jim Patterson Children's Hospital Foundation is committed to excellence and will only fund proposals that achieve an overall committee rating of 3.5 or higher on this scale. So that's the outstanding, excellent, and very good score ranges. Um, so I'll just talk a bit about how these scores are found. Uh, I talked about the criteria that's been looked at, and now this is the process. Uh, so the peer review is managed by SHRF, uh, as per the SHRF guidelines for peer review. Um, those can be found on our website on the peer review page, I believe. Uh, so we do recruit a multidisciplinary committee from across Canada with expertise in pediatric and maternal health. Um, we do try to match the review committee to the applications we're expecting to receive. Um, but if there are any highly specialized applications, we do recruit additional external reviewers um, to, rev to review those applications and provide comments to our review committee. Uh, just to make sure that everything is receiving a fair review, even if it's not um, wholly in the wheelhouse of our committee. Um, but it is something to keep in mind that this is an interdisciplinary committee that's going to be reading these applications um, and to write accordingly. Uh, the final score is a result of the committee discussion and final scoring. Um, for your review comments that you receive as part of your results, uh, you will receive the comments from the two lead reviewers only. Um, and then the funding is allocated top down based on the final scoring until the funding is exhausted or until we hit that 3.5 score cutoff. Um, so if there's still funding left over but no more applications above a 3.5, um, we still do not fund any further applications. 
uh, just some general tips before I give you our contact information and open it up for questions and address the questions in the chat box. Um, so most importantly, read the application package. Um, it is very long. There's a lot of information in there, but um, it's all important. Um, and as I kind of mentioned about um, writing for the committee, uh, just try to grab the reviewers' interest with your project. Um, like I mentioned, these are interdisciplinary reviewers, so they may or may not have a vested interest in your specific project. Um, so do make sure that you've outlined the importance of your research. Um, I guess that kind of falls under as well, make your case uh, and detail the how. So you want to really make the case of why this is important, why it's going to be impactful, and then make sure that they can understand how you are going to complete this and why you've chosen to do it that way. Um, it's always a good idea to make sure you've addressed any potential bumps in the road, um, limitations of the work, any risk mitigation you are expecting and have planned for. Um, generally, it ties into everything as well. Um, it should be fairly easy to read. Obviously, this is most of these are fairly dense information wise, but um, the reviewers should be able to follow your proposal formatting. Um, and it can help if the timelines and the budget justification also kind of reflect each other. Um, and finally, go back to the application package if you have any questions. Um, but also don't hesitate to reach out to Sheriff if you have any questions about the application process or to Jim Patterson Children's Hospital Foundation if you have any questions about the relevance of the research in the area. Uh, so we have some context here. Um, so for the program administration, we have SHRF. Um, so we have myself, I'm the programs and engagement manager. Um, and that is not the correct email for me, but I will be sending a follow-up to this webinar that will have the correct contact information. Um, if you have any technical issues with the RMS or the application form, um, we have Tanya, who is a lifesaver for those type of things. Um, so her email's there. She's also the face behind the help desk at sheriff.ca email. Um, so either one of those you email, you're gonna get Tanya and she will be able to help you. Uh, yeah, and there we have the CCV website and support email there as well, if you're having difficulties with that system. Uh, for Pattison's children, if you have any questions about them and their research support, uh, we have Alicia, um, who is unable to join us today, but her contact information there. And then Lisa, who I unfortunately somehow uh, set the webinar up weirdly that we had some difficulties, but she is online and might be able to help with some questions if there's any. Uh, so finally, uh, so there's a couple of questions in the Q&A box already, so it seems like people are finding it. Um, I'll answer those. Um, if there's any more questions, there is the Q&A feature or the chat box. Um, I will check both and um, Hopefully I'm able to provide your answers. If not, I can follow up with people after the webinar as well. Um, so, uh, so the first question, oh, I may be answered already. Uh, so it's a question about people with lived experience and their contribution to the research. Um, so in general, we're looking to see that the people who are using the health systems and programs and are being affected by the policies are also providing their perspectives and experience to the research. Um, as a way to make sure that research is going to be impactful and relevant. 
Um, so their contribution to the application is the testimonial and then um, contributions throughout the research um, can be there just to help guide priorities. Um, there is also, um, we have the Center for, is it Saskatchewan Center for Patient-Oriented Research here in, at the U of S. Um, so they may have some more resources as well about like if you're trying to recruit some people with lived experience to join your project team, um, if you have questions about honorarium and how you would pay these um, co-applicants for their contributions, um, any other kind of questions like that about involving people with lived experience in research. Um, if there are any other questions, I will stay online for a few minutes here to answer them. Um, if there are no more questions, I'll just say thank you again for joining us today. Um, hopefully this information was helpful and we look forward to seeing your applications. Oh, uh, so we have another question about the co-principal applicants. Um, and are there any eligibility requirements of the co-principal applicant that are not outlined in the guideline document? Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, the extra requirements around the principal applicant are really regarding their ability to hold peer review funds and administer the research. Um, so there really aren't any extra requirements of the co-principal applicant. Um, that role is mostly for individuals who um, they're not taking on the administrative duty of handling the peer review funds um, with the institution, but they're making significant intellectual contribution. Um, so we have seen different roles in that role. Um, so such as the knowledge users and people with lived experience could be co-principal applicants. Um, the next question is, what happens if different researchers submit proposals on similar subject areas? Um, I don't think we have any issues from our end um, funding multiple proposals in a similar area. Um, the unfor only unfortunate side effect I can think of is that they will be reviewed side by side. So if one does happen to be stronger or anything like that, um, the review committee will be comparing them directly. Um, but also uh, that could be a chance for um, if researchers get to know who's in their area, things like that, um, we're always encouraging collaboration. So if there are multiple researchers working in similar areas, uh, we always suggest that you reach out and talk to each other as well. Uh, hopefully those answered the question sufficiently. question box looks like it's getting a little bit quieter on me. Um, so yeah, thank you again, everyone for being here. Um, and I will stay on a few more minutes just in case you think of any further questions. Um, if not, please enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for your patience with us while I struggled with my computer.